Sapiens. By Yuval Noah Harari is one of the most influential books of the 21st century. And yet, the book has received sharp criticism from academics who say that the book didn't have any original findings. Which is it? Is Sapiens an original masterpiece or just an overrated copycat? The author, Yuval Noah Harari, has always been an incessantly curious person. He was born and raised in Israel, where he taught himself to read at age three. And that voracious reading habit was driven by his upbringing, where he developed an interest for grand narratives and grand ideas. He remembers saying to himself that, quote, when I grew up, I would not get bogged down in the mundane troubles of daily life, but understand the big picture. And when he began college at age 17, he studied history and international relations at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, where he's now a professor in the Department of History. It was immediately clear that Harari was a gifted writer when he wrote a paper as an undergrad that would be published by a peer-reviewed journal. But Harari quickly started feeling stuck and uncomfortable with some of Israel's conservative ideologies. And in 1998, he traveled to the University of Oxford to pursue a doctorate in history. Yuval was about midway through his PhD thesis when a friend recommended that he try meditation. Vipassana meditation. And that's when Yuval took a bus to a Vipassana center in the west of England. And in those days, he had some of the most profound experiences of his life. As he wrote to a friend in Israel, I'm now freed from my strings. I'm a real boy. That retreat led to a habit of building pockets of stillness into his life. The time to meditate gave him time to daydream, which I think of as a process of giving your subconscious control over the wheel of your mind. And as it steers your thoughts, the fragments of ideas that you've collected in the past turn into concepts that you can share in the future. After Harari completed his PhD studies in 2002, he came back to Israel, where he planned to pursue a postdoctoral study in history. And that's when he started teaching an undergraduate course called An Introduction to the History of the World. Despite his shyness and his inexperience as a professor, he soon found that notes about his class were spreading outside of the classroom. Harari began to wonder if he could create a self-contained work of nonfiction based on this class that he was teaching. So his 20 lectures soon became 20 chapters for his book. And the book was originally published in Hebrew back under the name of A Brief History of Humankind. And it was received pretty well locally. But beyond that, it was kind of a commercial failure. Harari couldn't get backed by foreign publishers, and when he tried to self-publish English prints on Amazon, it sold fewer than 2,000 copies. American publishers thought that Harari's works were just too grandiose and too arrogant. They thought that writing a book on the history of mankind gave the impression that Harari just thought too highly of himself because he intended to write the definitive book on anthropology. But Harari's luck turned in 2013 when the English version of the book was published internationally. That year, Sapiens made the New York Times bestseller list and won the National Library of China's Wen Jin Book Award. The book's popularity took off when Bill Gates recommended it on his blog, and Barack Obama, the sitting president of the United States at the time, shared it on social media. The public's reception of Sapiens was extraordinary. The book became an international acclaim and seeped into the culture, reaching even the kinds of people who only read one or two books a year. Some scholars, though, they weren't that impressed with Harari's work. They thought that it was just too broad and that it didn't seriously contribute to the knowledge in the field of anthropology. The philosopher Galen Strawson said, the attractive features of the book are overwhelmed by carelessness, exaggeration, and sensationalism. With more than 27 million copies sold, it's become the best-selling anthropology book of all time. But that's because it has the kind of captivating stories that you're never going to find in the very academic papers that he pulled from. The writing is beautiful, and that's why the book flew off bookshelves. Because as Harari knows, for complex topics, stories are the trunk that holds disparate branches of knowledge together and help us remember the ideas that we read. Now, what can we learn from the creative process of Yuval's notorious book? 
If you're watching this video, you might feel like you have to be 100% original in your creative pursuits. Oftentimes, as creatives, we worry too much about trying to come up with an idea that is like nothing that's ever been made before, which is an intimidating challenge that can make us insecure about our work. That feeling reminds me of a word from the world of photography, Vemo Dalen. It describes the crippling feeling that everything worth doing has already been done before. But it's born out of a twisted way of thinking about the creative process, where artists focus only on the final product of the works that they admire, but don't get around to studying the inspirational roots of those very works and the artists behind them. And when it comes to originality, Harari is the perfect case study. See, he was surprised by how little readers knew about the book's foundational ideas. And when he won awards for originality, he pushed back by saying, there is absolutely nothing there that is new. I'm not an archeologist, I'm not a primatologist. It was really reading the kind of common knowledge and just presenting it in a new way. And that last sentence is our key sentence here. You see, the success of Sapiens isn't a story about novelty, but one about combinatorial creativity. And its success comes not from his message, but from the delivery of his message. Another reason for our obsession with originality often comes from a fear of plagiarism that's instilled when we're young in school. You see, when we're students, we're threatened with Fs and expulsion for even the slightest hint of copying another person's work. And that fear of punishment leads us away from the virtues of creative synthesis. But we find inspiration in the ideas of other people all the time. Away from the world of writing, Kobe Bryant used to watch slow motion tape of his favorite basketball players and implement their best moves. Speaking about his own process for improvement, Kobe once said, there isn't a move that's a new move. There's nothing that hasn't been done before. I seriously have stolen all of these moves from all of these great players. But to return to the world of writing, my favorite example comes from the thesis of Joseph Heinrich's book, The Secret of Our Success. In the book, the Harvard professor argues that the secret of humanity's success over other animals lies not just in individual intelligence, but in the collective intelligence of society. Natural selection has favored genes for building brains with the ability to learn from other people. And humans are imitative creatures. It's how we get better at things. And in fact, in the time of Shakespeare, the word primate meant to imitate. You see, we outsource our intelligence to the cultures that we live inside of and unconsciously build upon the actions of our most successful peers. And as creatives, the task isn't to come up with ideas that are 100% original. It's to stand on the shoulders of brilliant people who've come before us to digest their ideas and spring to creative action during moments of epiphany. Because that's when we can turn the old into something new and the mundane into something extraordinary. When I look at Harari's work, I say his scholarship is impressive because of its combinatorial nature and not in spite of it. When I went back to the book to go look at the note section at the end, I saw hundreds of references that are wide ranging from a book about grooming gossip and the evolution of language in the first chapter to an article about artificial brains in the 20th. And what seems like originality can often just be a combination of ideas from a bunch of obscure sources that connect dots that most people have never connected before and communicate them in ways that grip an audience. As some people like to say, borrowing from one person is plagiarism, borrowing from thousands of them, we just call that research. And so as creatives, we should remember that an obsession with originality can sometimes be counterproductive. And we can learn from authors like David Epstein, who tries to read 10 journal articles per day when he's thinking through a new book. And of course, we can also follow in the footsteps of Yuval Harari, who surveyed the world of anthropology for two decades before he synthesized his best ideas into sapiens. And by the way, if you want to be free from your strengths and unleash your inner creativity, make sure to hit that subscribe button because I'm gonna be breaking down the processes of the world's greatest creators every single week. And in the meantime, I've already made videos exploring the processes of Kendrick Lamar and Christopher Nolan, which you can check out by clicking here and here.